I collect television sets, um, and um, Sandra Whittleson collects brains. I'm not kidding. She has the world's best collection of brains. And if I can get her on stage, perhaps she'll tell us a little bit more. Oh, all right. There she is. And the other interesting thing about Professor Whittleson, <laughs> Professor of Psychiatry and Neuroscience at McMaster University, is that she was with us last year. And uh, we heard last year about this astonishing story. Um, I don't know how many of you were here last year, but uh, by some strange and surreal circumstance, uh, Sandra came into possession of Einstein's brain. And so last year, she gave us a talk about why he was Einstein and we were not. Um, and now you have new research. You continue to work in that area, and you have new information for us. This year, I'm going to talk about ideas right. rather than data. OK. The difference between, between ideas and, and data. data. I'm, I'm still overwhelmed by the beauty of that, of that acrobatic act. It's one of the most beautiful and awesome things I think I've ever seen in human movement. It's, um, it's mind-boggling. Um, it, it, it shows the capability of the human brain, because it's not the muscles only that can do that. So um, what I do. Um, is to study uh, brain function in relation to human thought. This used to be called physiological psychology when I started studying at McGill University, where I met Moses and uh, a whole group of people from Montreal. Um, it's now called cognitive neuroscience, but it's the same thing. And uh, last year, um, as, 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 as Moses said, um, because some of the work that my group uh, did uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, um, there was a lot of news coverage, because anything associated with Albert Einstein gets a lot of coverage, and certainly his brain. Um, and because of the work that I had been doing, uh, I was uh, offered, invited, actually, to study of the brain, which I still have, and people ask me where it is, but of course I don't say but it is in a place where no one would find it. Um, <laughs> and what I talked about last year uh, was a little bit about how the brain works, just to give some background of what is where in the human brain, because as you know, the human brain is not like the, uh, the liver, which is homogeneous in its tissue, but different parts of the brain do m different things. So you could really think of the brain as a multifaceted organ. And I did this, um, and I talked specifically about the male brain, and that's because I use that as a control to study Albert Einstein, and one has to consider the sex of the individual because of some of my other work, as well as other work done around the world, has been showing recently that there are actually anatomical and chem chemical differences uh, between the brains of men and women, which surely has some implications for the differences in our behavior, but that, of course, is a topic for, for another time. Um, so maybe, maybe I could be invited back a third time because I'm so pleased to be here. Um, so that's what I talked about last year, and I, I, I talked about the, uh, what, that we had, in one sentence, what we found was that the gross anatomy of the brain uh, of Einstein was different to the naked eye. And it was different not just quantitatively, but qualitatively. It had a different morphology, a different pattern, uh, than any brain in uh, the collection that I have at McMaster University or that anyone else has in their collection or in any atlas. Namely, the parietal lobes, which are here, uh, which are important for visual imagery, which is probably crucial for developing the theory of relativity. That part of the brain was different. Anyways, what I want to talk about uh, this year is something that is much more speculative and it's something that I started thinking about um, recently uh, because of some new groups of friends that I've, I've developed. 
and I became um, uh, both as an individual but also as a neuroscientist uh, perplexed by the uh, extent of belief that people can have in, in uh, objects, concepts, philosophies, ideas, belief systems for which there is no evidence, um, such as gods and, and religions. And I began to remember some things that I had come across in the field of cognitive neuroscience many years ago, um, which had stuck in my mind, but now I'm sort of going to attach them to an idea. And I thought that this would be a very appropriate form to talk about this subset of ideas, namely belief systems or causal hypotheses. Um, so just let me show you a the, in the first slide, um, one thing about the brain, it, it's, very, it's also very lucky, I feel I'm very lucky in my professional life because when you start studying, you never know if what you're going to start is going to be useful or interesting three decades later. And of course, the field that I'm in now uh, is, is one of the forefronts of, of scientific endeavor. And so, I mean, I'm just uh, damn lucky to, to be in a field that is so exciting with the new techniques allowing us to ask questions that could never have been asked before. How many people know what a spleen looks like or a kidney or a heart even? But everyone knows what a human brain looks like because you can't go very far without seeing the picture of a brain. You can't read newspapers without look, coming across the medical or scientific um, uh, sections without learning something new about how the normal brain functions, the cause of various neurological disorders. Um, we don't need that slide anymore. Um, and so what I want to talk about uh, and give you a flavor of some of the things that have led me to try to share with you what I think could be the neurology of belief systems is the following. About 15, 20 years ago, an MIT graduate in engineering named Neil was undergoing surgery for the removal of uh, a part of the brain um, for epilepsy. As you know, epilepsy involves um, the synchronous activity of many neurons. Uh, oh, we don't need that slide either yet. <laughs> um, and uh, and that th this results in the seizures, the behavioral seizures that can be um, visualized, that you can see. And in most cases, drugs can control the epilepsy. But there are some cases which are not amenable to drug therapy. And in those cases, the neurosurgeon goes in and removes the, um, the damaged tissue, which could be caused from birth or accidents or, or, or uh, toxic uh, influences. This, of course, um, uh, the, the, the one wants to make sure when one is taking out brain tissue that the cure is not worse than the disease. Um, as you well know, uh, speech and language functions are in one part of the brain rather than another. I'm sure most of you know that. It happens to be the left hemisphere in about 95% of people. And if you damage a certain part of the left hemisphere, you can't understand language, you can't produce language. And so if the epilepsy happens to be in a part of the brain that is close to those regions, you can interfere and make the individual aphasic, which is perhaps even worse than having the epileptic seizures. So what neuro neurosurgeons do, and this was pioneered by the late great neuro neurosurgeon, uh, Canadian, or he, he came to live in Canada, uh, at the Montreal Neurological Institute, Wilder Penfield, and he developed the technique that you actually stimulate the brain while the individual is on the operating table. So the individual is sedated, but not um, anesthetized. And the individual knows that the brain is going to be stimulated uh, mildly, and he's either going to feel things or do things or be asked questions. And this way, the neurosurgeon can actually find out what the functions are of the part of the brain that he is looking at and just how uh, careful he should be and how perhaps he should be very conservative in what is removed. So Neil was undergoing this kind of surgery, and he uh, and different parts of the, 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 the scalp was removed, 
uh, part of the, uh, the, the skull is bored uh, away and uh, removed, and the brain is actually exposed to the open air, and it is stimulated. And in one of the spots when it was being stimulated, Neil moved his hand like this. And the neurosurgeon saw this and realized he was in a part that we call the motor cortex. But Neil also saw that he moved his hand. And you have to remember that he knew where he was. He knew that he was being stimulated, his brain was being stimulated by a dozen surgeons and nurses and, and, and uh, researchers uh, around him. And he said, my arm moved, someone made me do it. So I'm gonna leave that for a moment and now tell you about some other uh, information. Um, if we have the next slide. Um, this just shows what the brain actually looks like in, in, in real life uh, when it's taken out uh, and actually fixed in some kind of preservative like formalin. And I just wanted to give you just a general idea about the outside that looks yellowish. That's what is called the gray matter. And the lighter stuff in the middle, which looks white, that's called the white matter. And the white matter are just the long fibers or axons that come out of each brain cell. And they are the things that actually connect one cell to another. And you can see that there are two hemispheres. You can see that there is a, uh, a cleft going from front to back. And that divides the, two, the brain into the left and right hemispheres. Well, one can actually cut the main fiber tract, the main white matter tract, between the left and the right hemispheres. That those individuals are called commissurotomized people because the commissures are cut. Um, or eat more readily uh, labeled as split brain patients. This has become another surgical technique for people with epilepsy. In cases that are even more severe, uh, severely affected with epilepsy, where the epileptic focus ends up causing every part of the brain to be pulled in and it ends up that the whole brain is in an epileptic discharge and individuals can have um, one seizure after another after another each day and are literally are chronically in an epileptic seizure. About, um, I guess, 30 years ago, uh, the late Dr. Roger Sperry, uh, who subsequently won the Nobel Prize for the philosophical implications of what he did, uh, because with a surgical knife, he cut consciousness in half, which I will mention in a minute. But what happened is, is that uh, some neurosurgeons and some patients were brave enough to allow uh, an experimental clinical technique that had only been done on non-human animals before um, to divide the hemispheres. And of course, what this does is it at least contains the epileptic discharge to one hemisphere. So at least you've got half your brain that is not in uh, status epilepticus. As the aside, well, well, let, well, let me say this, that when you do that, the two hemispheres can't communicate with each other. So that what one hemisphere is aware of, the other hemisphere isn't. And so with appropriate testing, you can actually demonstrate that if you communicate with the left hemisphere, the individual will tell you and be, show you that he is aware of certain things but the other part of his brain has no way of knowing it unless the left hemisphere talks about it and then the right hemisphere hears it. Otherwise, there would be no connection. And uh, Sperry won the Nobel Prize for this whole um, it, philosophical issue of what does it mean to be human and to have a persona, an ego, a self understanding, a consciousness, if the knight can actually cut it in half and you're not aware at any one time of of, of, of part of your brain is not aware of what the other part of the brain, and if, if, if you, like me, think of mind and brain as synonymous, then it means you have two minds. At any rate, uh, in the next slide, there's just two things that I want you to know for, for, for this second and last piece of data that I want to tell you. Uh, one is that language is represented mainly in one hemisphere, the left hemisphere. So that would be the one that has the apple, for example. The other thing to remember is that the way the brain is wired up to receive information from the environment is contralateral. The left side information goes to the right hemisphere, 
and the right side to the left. The right side of the world goes to the left side. And in this uh, slide, uh, which actually is taken from Sperry's uh, writings, you see that there is a, a, the yellow background is between the two hemispheres. That's to indicate that this is the brain of a split brain individual. So in this case, what you see is that the, the fixation point is uh, the line, the, that black line between the banana and the apple in, those, in the rectangles. The apple is on the right side and it goes to the left hemisphere and vice versa. So these individuals who have these split brains have been the subjects and actually they make their living by being research subjects and undergoing all, uh, uh, all the intelligent things that psychologists can figure out to, uh, to do with them. One of the tasks was to see just what each hemisphere was capable of. So now maybe some of you can anticipate um, the kind of situation that uh, was put forward to uh, uh, these subjects. And I'm going to give you the response of one particular subject who's known as PPS. He was shown two different pictures at the same time. He was shown a, um, a chicken claw instead of the apple, and he was shown a snow scene instead of the banana. Two pictures, very different. And then he was asked to point from an array of pictures what were the objects that matched the two pictures that he just saw. And when you point, because the hands are also connected contralaterally, with his right hand, which is connected, uh -huh. with his right hand that was connected to his left hemisphere, which had seen the, the, the chicken claw, he selected the chicken. And with his other hand, he selected a shovel. And he was then asked, so why did you choose those? And remember, he's speaking. And so he could only speak with what, with his left hemisphere. And he said, well, I chose the chicken because it goes with the chicken claw. And I chose the shovel because I had to clean out the chicken shed. <laughs> and so do you see the, the implication of that? Um, I can't look to the back because these lights are, if I'm not looking there, it's because the lights are so strong. Um, the implication is that this individual saw what he pointed to but his left hemisphere didn't have the faintest knowledge of why he chose the shovel, because it couldn't get that information. He could have said, I don't know, but he didn't. What he did is he confabulated, and this wasn't done facetiously. What he did to the best of his ability is come up with an explanation for what he saw he did, because things aren't supposed to be random. There has to be reasons for what you do. I th yes, so we can take that slide off. If we think, if we just go away from the neuropsychological laboratory and we, we, um, we think of writers, and I want to make sure I quote them uh, correctly. This is my own personal slide. We're not supposed to have slides. Um, William Blake, for example, said, my words are mine, yet not mine. You see, attributing them to some other source, not thinking that they could just be his own. Joyce Carol Oates, and I, I didn't bring the actual quote, said something very similar in that writers were just a conduit for words that came from outer selves. And so when people are faced with things that are inexplicable to them. Suddenly a poem comes into their mind. Suddenly uh, a, a, a symphony. People very often attribute this to something outside of themselves. And what I want to suggest is that this brain, this human brain that has evolved, which is capable of such incredible intellectual feats, as you've heard today, um, all the, the magnificent sculptures and, and architectural uh, edifices and, and um, uh, choreography and, and, and writings and speaking, um, the human brain has evolved 
to be such a magnificent organ that it produces this complex, abstract uh, productions in many different modalities. And what I want to suggest is that along with this ability to deal with abstract thoughts, and along with this um, almost instinct to, con to, to come up with hypotheses about why things happened so that you don't leave them inexplicable, along with this is, in a way, the, an, inevitable, an inevitable production of a concept of some uh, superhuman intelligence some superhuman force that is responsible and is the controller and the originator of all the things that mankind finds inexplicable, like the droughts, the thunderstorms, the bad things that happen to good people, the, the bad DNA that you might get, all these chance things that are inexplicable, um, the, the brain has evolved in such a way that there are interpretations, not just for why the hand moved up or why uh, the shovel was, 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 was chosen, but why am I here? Why has my child died, etc. And so that this this might be a very unsettling idea to, to many people, maybe 95% of the population. What has actually baffled me and intrigued me is, is if one looks at the statistics, 95% of people, particularly in North America, believe in some kind of spiritual entity, gods, or a monotheistic god, or witches, um, goblins, things that are not in our experience. And 90% actually believe in a personal god, one with whom or with it, that they can actually have some personal communication. And so I ask myself, um, how could this be that rational people, uh, people who perhaps are particularly highly uh, educated, um, choose to believe this? I mean, even my hero, Albert Einstein, um, he, there were certain things that he could not, as you may know, he died before he was able to solve some of the last questions that he, the unified theory uh, that he was um, struggling with for the rest of his life. And to him, this was inexplicable. And even Einstein had a kind of a religion. It wasn't a personal God. It was a very abstract concept, but that there was some kind of cosmic force that actually put things together in such harmony that he could actually come up with a formula like E equal MC squared, that something as simple and as beautiful as that could actually represent what's going on in the universe. Somebody or some, some intelligent force must have been out there to, um, to, to make it be that way. Um, so what I, what I want to sort of offer to you as sort of an idea just to, to, to think about is that the reason why belief systems and the belief in God, and I'm using this in a very general uh, format, is because our brains are hardwired to seek explanations and, to, and, they, and it, they, our brain has the ability to create all kinds of complex uh, ideas to have a causal hypothesis of what is inexplicable. And why would this be? Well, one can think of two reasons. One, it certainly would have been adaptive in terms of evolutionary uh, phylogenetic development 
that if you could have a hypothesis about which caves, for example, are going to be dry or safer, if you could come up with hypotheses, then you were going to survive and uh, procreate um, more readily, and then you would have been selected for. In addition, the reduction of anxiety um, is a very powerful and also very adaptive in terms of biological health. It's a very important factor. Abstract philosophical idea, but something that is beyond the rational. And the irony, in a way, is that when we think of those kinds of thoughts and we think of it as spiritual thinking, one likes to think about it as something that is emotional. But in the scheme that I'm offering you, it is not a consequence of the emotional part of the brain at all, but it is a consequence of that gray matter, which is what is so unique in humans, the amount of gray matter that we have within a certain amount of volume of, of the brain, that it is the rational part of our brain which has this compulsion to come up with explanatory causes, which has come up with the concept of belief systems, which, which in some respects we, we, we call religion. And, and I guess, you know, to close on a personal note, I have to realize that in a way, this thinking that, 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 that I have, in a way, I suppose, is my attempt to find a, a causal hypothesis, an understanding of why so many people have these, quote, irrational thoughts, so that I'm just another individual who's trying to find an explanation for what I find inexplicable. <laughs> so um, thank you for listening. God. The brain. <laughs> Did I understand that correctly, though? You think that God is like a hardwired point in the brain that, if stimulated, would cause me to. No, no. No, it, God is just one of the many concepts. So it's, it's not the specific thing, it is a part of the brain, and actually, it's here. Left frontal. But it is uh, a part of the brain that seems to be crucial for coming up with these interpretations uh, for the inexplicable. And a god-like um, construct would just be one other uh, but very powerful construct. Thank I can't believe much. I said this in public. Okay. <laughs>